Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today, we're going to try and push the Radeon RX 5700 XT to its limits by strapping on EK's new Vector water block for the Navi base graphics cards. EK were kind enough to quickly send one of these over to me so I can play around with it. I've had it for a little while now, but obviously we've been quite busy with a lot of the Zen 2 content we've been doing. But anyway, I've got it now, so a big thank you to EK for sending that over. If you missed it in my initial 5700 series review, I noted that increasing the fan speed of the 5700 XT to an ear bleeding 100%, I was able to boost the GPU up from around 1800 megahertz. So that's basically what it runs at stock. And I was able to push it up to 2050 megahertz. So that was a 14% overclock. Then after all the day one reviews went live, Igor's lab published an interesting piece based on some findings by Radeon Tweaker group user Helm. I think if I got that wrong, sorry. Anyway, the user created some power play table mods for the 5700 series that made it possible to bypass AMD's overclocking limits imposed at the BIOS level. These simple yet genius Windows registry modifications allowed users to circumvent AMD's limits and increase the GPU frequency as high as 2300 megahertz while also increasing the power limit. Of course, the GPU silicon has to be good enough to run at 2.3 gigahertz, and sadly, neither of my retail cards were able to run at even 2.2 gigahertz. Rather, 2.1 gigahertz was the limit, which was a shame, but that's still around an 18% overclock, so I'm expecting a nice performance uplift. Before we get into the benchmarks, though, just a quick refresher on what we found so far. After an hour-long F1 2019 loop, the 5700 XT in its stock configuration with the reference blower cooler, ran it around 1780 megahertz once the card reached its peak operating temperature of 84 degrees in a 21 degree ambient room. Under the same conditions with the EK vector block installed and attached to a 240 millimeter radiator with two super quiet 120 millimeter fans, the 5700 XT peaked at just 45 degrees. So that's a massive 39 degree drop in temperature. Meanwhile, the GDDR6 memory temperature dropped by 20 degrees and the VRM temperature dropped by as much as 30 degrees. Having tried all the registry modifications, I found that 2.1 gigahertz was the limit of my ASUS reference card. Again, I did try all of the registry options and just pushing past 2110 megahertz just caused games to crash. And I found the same limit with my power color reference 5700 XT as well. So. I guess I haven't done that well with this silicon lottery here. But as I noted a moment ago, that's still an 18% overclock, and given the 5700 XT was only 9% slower on average than the RTX 2080, this overclock should push the Radeon GPU ahead. Of course, you can also overclock the 2080, but that's not really the point. We're trying to achieve 2080 light performance at a significant discount. So let's fire up the Core i9-9900K GPU test rig and see how the liquid cooled 5700 XT performs. First up we have F1 2019 and here we see a modest 9% bump in performance for the average frame rate and a slightly less impressive 6% boost for the 1% low result. This did allow the 5700 XT at 2.1 GHz to match the GTX 1080 Ti, though it was still 5% slower than the RTX 2080. Not exactly a big margin, but I was hoping the overclock would yield better results. Moving on to Battlefield 5, and here we see a far less impressive 5% boost in performance for the average frame rate, though the 1% low performance was improved by a 7% margin. Having said that, the 1% low frame rate is still a bit weak, at least relative to the RTX 2080, but overall an impressive result given that we're looking at RTX 2080 super light performance in this title. Here we see the most impressive gain yet, a 10% boost in performance, at least for the average frame rate, when testing with Rainbow Six Siege. While this does push the 5700 XT ahead of the stock 1080 Ti, it's still slower than the RTX 2070 Super, and much slower than the RTX 2080 Super. Next up we have Metro Exodus, and here we see a very mild 7% improvement in performance, going from 72 FPS to 77 FPS, and that wasn't enough to catch even the 2070 Super in this title. Another lackluster 7% gain can be seen when testing with Resident Evil 2, though this time that was enough to at least match the RTX 2070 Super. Shadow of the Tomb Raider disappointed with only a 6% improvement in performance, but at least that was enough to match the GTX 1080 Ti and RTX 2070 Super. Another 6% gain can be seen when testing with Fortnite, but here we're only talking an extra 6 FPS, so in my opinion it's probably not worth the trouble. 
Then moving on to the Division 2, we see another 7% performance uplift for the 2.1 GHz overclock, and that was enough to match the RTX 2070 Super in this title. Dirt Rally 2 sees just a 5% boost, going from 102 FPS to just 107 FPS, so a very disappointing result here. The Radeon RX 5700 XT already killed it in Forza Horizon 4, and here we see just a weak 3% improvement from the overclock, but still that was enough to take out top spot, and I suspect we're probably becoming CPU limited at this point. Interestingly, Far Cry New Dawn provides a really nice 12% performance boost, and this put the 5700 XT right on the heels of the RTX 2080, and I really wish we saw more results like this. Second last game that we're going to look at is World War Z, and here we see a 6% improvement in performance from the overclock, and that's just half of what we saw in Far Cry. And we finish up on a very disappointing 4% performance boost in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, so let's move on to check out some power consumption figures. For what was a 7% boost on average, you're looking at almost a 40% increase in power consumption as the GPU power draw increased from just 186 watts right up to a Vega-like 258 watts. Then looking at total system consumption, we see a 25% increase in power draw for the overclocked 5700 XT, making it slightly more power hungry than Vega 64 and around 30 watts more than the RTX 2080 Ti. So it seems the 2.1 GHz overclock destroys our DNA's efficiency. Well, that was super disappointing. I guess AMD can do it as well. <laughs> but seriously, the Radeon RX 5700 XT it is really a great product, and I still have very high hopes for the upcoming AIB models. Unfortunately though, your chances of pushing one of these things to RTX 2080 Super or even 2080 levels of performance are pretty slim, even at 2.2 GHz, I feel it's a bit of a stretch. Sure, there are some games that, well, games that are more favourable to the red team, let's say. In those kind of games, the 5700 XT will pull off the upset, will we'll nudge ahead of those 2080 Super models. But overall, yeah, it's it's not going to match them for for the vast majority of games. Spending $140 US on the EK Vector Navi block, that does take the price of the 5700 XT up to $540 US. And for that money, you can buy an RTX 2070 Super, which overall will deliver a similar level of performance, obviously increasing the cost of the 5700 XT by 35% for what we saw at best was a 12% performance increase. Uh, at least for my particular retail card that could only do 2.1 gigahertz, that's not really a good investment. But would I rather an RTX 2070 Super Partner card or a liquid-cooled Radeon RX 5700 XT? It's a bit of a tough one, I have to admit, but I think I would rather have the liquid-cooled graphics card. Of course, for that option to make any kind of sense, you already need to have or at least be interested in getting a custom liquid cooling setup. And there is a third option, and that would be just to wait for the board partner cards to be released, the air-cooled 5700 XTs, and frankly, that option makes the most sense. Uh, we should have those some point next month, perhaps later next month, so yeah, at this point, I'd just wait to see how that plays out. With a decent air cooler, my 5700 XTs will still run at 2.1 GHz while making very little noise, and I expect the temperatures to be in the 70 degree range. The main reason I made this video was to see what all the fuss was about, and I also wanted to check out that really nice looking vector block from EK for the Navi GPUs, and I certainly wasn't disappointed there. EK make excellent products. Just quickly as a side note, I've seen heaps of YouTubers raving about how amazing the PowerPlay table mods are, jumping up and down about 15, even 20% overclocking headroom. And yeah, it all sounds very exciting. I get that. I was very excited putting this thing together. I couldn't wait to see what it could do. But yeah, unfortunately, not as exciting as a 15 to 20% frequency increase seems to be because sadly, on average, I was only able to extract a very mild 7% boost. So yeah, 7% increase in frame rates on average. And I just feel with so many people raving about the overclocking headroom being as high as 20%, but not actually doing any testing to see what that 20% boost in frequency gives you. Yeah, I feel like the whole thing's just become massively overhyped. And well, that tends to be what happens with new AMD products these days, it seems. 
Don't get me wrong, the 5700 XT is an incredibly good value product. And if we get quality AIB models for under $450 US, they will be the graphics cards to get south of $700 US. But they aren't overclocking monsters, and if you care about value, spending more money on upgraded cooling really isn't a wise choice. Just lastly, in a lot of games tested, I only saw gains as high as 6% from the overclock, the 18% frequency overclock, and even sometimes the gains were just 5, 4, and even 3%. So why does the 5700 XT seem to scale so poorly when overclocked? Well, at the moment, I've really only got a theory to go on, but that theory is that the card is memory limited. And you can't really overclock the GDDR6 memory. Stock it comes clocked at 875 megahertz, and going beyond 900 megahertz isn't really possible. For example, I saw artifacting at just 920 megahertz. Something else I noticed is that when increasing the memory frequency by 3% to 900 megahertz, that would often drop 1% low performance, and at 920 megahertz, where I was seeing graphical glitches on occasion, the 1% low performance and even the average frame rate dropped further. But of course, memory errors will cause a performance regression. What I really want to do is underclock the GDDR6 memory, and I want to do that to look at two things. Firstly, just how memory starved is the 5700 XT? Does dropping the frequency down to say 850 megahertz have a noticeable impact on performance? I suspect it will. Also, does performance tank at 800 megahertz? Again, I suspect it will, but sadly, I can't test this as the card is locked at 875 megahertz, and right now, I haven't found a way to circumvent this. I'd also like to see if the 1% low performance actually improves at slightly lower clock speeds for the memory. And some titles, Navi suffers from pretty weak 1% low performance, and I wonder if that's a result of the memory being clocked so close to its limits out of the box. Of course, this is just a theory, don't go running with it and assuming that that is the case. Very little evidence to go on at this point, so if anyone knows how to bypass the 875 megahertz frequency floor for the 5700 XT, then please let me know in the comment section below and I'll happily go back and look at that. Anyway, that is gonna do it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to hit the like button, that's always much appreciated. And you can subscribe for more content if you haven't done so already. Also, consider supporting us on Patreon. You will gain access to our exclusive Discord chat and monthly live streams with Tim and myself. Anyway, as always, thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.